So when someone comes with, with a negative comment, you know, it sticks with you. But I would say that is what makes the creative. Because you ultimately get to the point where you realize, no, I am the one who is actually creating the art, and you aren't. Why? Why are you scared? Yeah, I think, I think that speaks to people projecting their own insecurities, their own failures, their own fears onto you. Because you, yeah. as the creative, you are the one who has taken a bold stance, you know, to say, I want to share pieces of me with the world for, 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 for a positive effect, you know. And when that person, that one hater, or two, or three, or ten, <laughs> or ten, depending on how big you are. Yeah. <laughs> and so when those haters come and say, you know, this sucks, it, it sticks with you because you are in the process of overcoming all those fears because you know we live in a culture of domination yeah. so we live in a culture where to speak either as a painter as a photographer as a writer as a musician yeah. to speak is 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 an act of talking back you know talking back to the system you're talking back to to to, to people talking back to family friends etc yeah so when you're in the when you're in that process you know you you are still learning to come to terms with yourself. Yeah. You are overcoming your own fears. You are developing your own confidence. So when someone comes with, with a negative comment, you know, it sticks with you. But I would say that is what makes the creative. Because you ultimately get to the point where you realize, no, I am the one who is actually creating the art. And you aren't. Why? Why are you scared to speak? I'm, yeah. the one, I'm the one who has taken a bold stance to speak here, you see. So when you make that realization, you now see, no, yeah. they are being challenged by, by, by your confidence. And so it makes them uncomfortable. It is unsettling. Going back to uh, 2016, Upper mm -hmm. Six, um, it, it's quite a novel thing. Like I was saying to you before we actually started recording is that it's quite a novel thing uh, for someone at that age to think, I'm going to create this platform and address all these issues and inform people, right? Mm -hmm. uh, what I'd like to think, to, to ask you, if, if you still remember and you, can, uh, and you can actually explain is, what were you seeing at that time that informed the decision to one, inform people, mm -hmm. but more importantly, take it to the internet because um, internet penetration is not a big thing in Zoom. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. taking things to the internet at such an early age, is, it, it's really fascinating to me. What, what, were, what was your thinking at that time? Okay, I think um, we can break this down into two aspects. Yeah. The first aspect is the calling. Yeah. And then the second aspect is exposure to technology and urban culture. Yeah. as people who grew up in urban areas. So... Let's, let's start with the calling. Yeah. Uh, when, 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 when I was still a kid, um, I think around in primary school, I remember myself as a person who wanted to explore uh, knowledge that is not conventional yeah. to kids <laughs> of that age. You see, like maybe by, by, by the fifth grade, I was cramming capital cities of countries in the world, you know. Yeah. And who does that at fifth grade? Yeah, it's not really a thing. <laughs> so I, I actually remember I, 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 was, I was stuck between saying when I grow up I want to be a pastor and when I grow up I want to be an archaeologist. So I think it was this desire to dig information and spread it to people, you know, considering that most of us come from Christian backgrounds, yeah. you know. So that art of finding information, just trying to share it with, with, with people, you know. And then, on the other hand, you have your exposure to, to urban music, you have your exposure to TV, you have your exposure to, as, as, as time went on, around 2011, 12, yeah. we yeah. were now starting to get into social media, you know, Facebook. Smartphone, yeah, mobile, and, internet. Exactly. <laughs> and 
I think it was a thing to, to be connected to the internet. You know, when it first, of course, in America, Europe, you know, they were, they, they, they're not quite used to it. Yeah. But for us here in the global south, it was, it was, it was novel. It was yeah. a huge phenomenon, you know. So around uh, high school, you are increasingly becoming a music geek, you know, uh, yeah. primarily following music that is not conventional, music that your mother would say, don't listen to that. Yeah. <laughs> and and what, what, what were we exposed to? We were exposed to mostly American hip hop, R&B, yeah. uh, Jamaican dance or and then here in Africa, you have music from Nigeria, Ghana, South Africa, yeah. and most importantly, Zimbabwe. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so because I remember 2016, mm -hmm. man, that was almost peak Zim Danzo, man. 2016, Don't even take me back there. 2016 was, was peak Zim Danzo, <laughs> and you also had brilliant Zim Hip Hop, even though it was being overshadowed by, by, yeah. by, by Zim Danzo. But Zim yeah. Hip Hop had, had its moment around 2012, Early on, yeah. yeah. And then it was just steady, steady like that. So all those influences, you see, they, they, they made me into a person who was just naturally inclined towards the arts, towards culture, towards entertainment. Yeah. And, you know, we were realizing the importance of the internet uh, school, high school, uh, taking computer subjects, learning the basics of Microsoft Word, Excel, yeah. Internet Explorer, what, what, you see. So now by A level, when I chose to do arts, you know, because this is what I was naturally gifted at yeah. uh, in high school, O level. So I realized that, no, I'm good with, with, with history. I'm good with literature. <laughs> I'm good with the English language itself. Yeah. You know, even though it is foreign to us, but then you realize, that, oh, I can actually do this thing. Yeah. So now in, in A level, you have a higher consciousness. Not, not a higher consciousness as such, but it is gradually developing. Yeah, I, th I think you're just older, man. Yeah. There's something, yeah. I remember there's something very calm exactly. about an A level student <laughs> compared so to everyone else in that institution. You, you, you are studying uh, literature and English, and you are being fascinated by all these words, you know, all these poems, all these novels, plays, etc. Like, yeah. no, I just want to be a writer, you know, like these guys. And so you start developing your, your skill, reading yeah. the dictionary every day, going to the library, even searching for books that are not prescribed in the syllabus, yeah. you know, but you are searching that. But the crucial moment where I realized that actually have to take stuff to the internet. Because before that crucial moment, yeah. I was a person who was just posting political posts and music posts. And yeah. uh, I actually remember my mother saying, don't, don't post politics. You know? <laughs> but you know, when, yeah. you're, when, you're in, when you're an A-level kid and you're posting politics after reading an opinion from Sunday Mail or The Standard, like, yeah, the, the system is messed. Oh. <laughs> but then you don't yeah. have the accurate or, 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 <laughs> or precise language to actually make it into this the cohesive Yeah, thought. exactly. <laughs> so, yeah, I was making those posts. I was making, but then the crucial moment was when I got into the junior parliament. Uh, so our school was quite isolated mission school, yeah. deep in the younger village, but full of middle class kids and upper class and elite yeah. kids. And then you're in there and you realize, um, my counterparts in the city are doing this and this and this and this and this, but I'm just out here and the school won't even, Disconnected give, from and the school won't even give me money just to go maybe to Nyanga or Mtari or Rusape just to do a simple thing. So I was like, no, let me use the internet. That's it. And then I developed a page. Um, by that time also, I had started to develop this habit of writing poems. So yeah. I was getting good with poetry. 
I actually think most writers start with, with, with poetry because poetry is like a, a medium of self-recovery where you're trying to overcome those inner voices telling you, don't write, don't write. Yeah. So I had this book, uh, you know, it had, it had some nice poems. They were nice, I remember them. They were nice. And they were also painful, you know, because <laughs> you are growing up, you are getting close to 18 and you're trying to find yourself. Yeah, you're experiencing a lot of things. Yeah. But then, uh, crucially, I developed that Facebook page. I called it the Child Forum. You called it the what? Child Forum. The Child Forum. Yeah. Fair enough. So, <laughs> speaking about yeah, child marriages, uh, rural kids are at a disadvantage, uh, pretty much stuff like that, you know. And so it developed, 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 developed. And sometimes it, it those assemblies after church service yeah. at a mission school, I would just stand up and just say one or two things, you know, just to develop that art of dealing with words. Yeah, communicating. And, yeah, communicating them with people, you see. So I'm doing that, I'm doing that. But at the same time, I'm now getting deeper into social media, you yeah. see, Facebook. <laughs> I was now doing Twitter by that time. Yeah. And I was the only one who was doing Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> Which is why I think it is, it is a calling, you know, because by that time I was just doing stuff of my own, stuff that an A-level kid wouldn't be doing, yeah. you know. I was listening to Hope Masike at A-level, and people were... We were surprised. Yeah, this guy is weird. <laughs> and, I was, and, I was, and, I, and I was and I was and I was singing along to Chronic songs word by word. You just go on YouTube, you search for a lyric video, and start yeah. cramming. So as I developed the page, I then realized, ha, huh, I need to to expand uh, my wings. Because yeah. also that term as a as a junior parliamentarian is only for one year. So when it was now coming to an end, around July, August 2016, yeah. that is when I changed the child forum. So I just changed the name. And I remember I was, I think I spent almost a month trying to think of a name. Yeah. And I would ask this other friend of mine, he was, he's called Tinevimbo, and I would say, yo dog, uh, what do you think would be the best name for, for, yeah. for, <laughs> for this idea that I'm having? Because I wanted to cover sport. Mm -hmm. I wanted to cover music, mm -hmm. Zimbabwean music, because I was such a huge fanatic of Zimbabwean music, and I was thinking people are not giving Zimbabwean music a chance. It's a due credit, yeah. yeah. It was actually in 2016, um, T-Gons and Cindy, they had this song, Rombo. Yeah. And I was such a huge fan. And I actually believe I was the only one at school bump into that song like like a fanatic. Yeah, a mad man. Yeah. yeah. So I would write about all those songs. And then as if an epiphany, I had the Zimbabwe sphere. The Zimbabwe sphere. But it really sounded incredibly long to me. Yeah. But at the same time it sounded <laughs> like this so is it. Like, it sounded convincing, <laughs> you know. Like, no, we live in a sphere. You know? Live in a sphere. The earth is a sphere. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Some people had to be ex excommunicated from churches for just simply saying the earth is a sphere. Yeah. So I said, okay, Zim Sphere. So I changed the name and I started yeah. doing uh, Zimbabwean music, Zimbabwean yeah. sport, a little bit of politics, but I, I, I would mostly reserve politics to my personal platforms. But yeah. gradually I started writing yeah, politics on that, on that page. Yeah. Yeah. So for the rest of 2016, I didn't do much because then we were writing our final exams. And then 2017, yeah. when we were now waiting for our results, uh, you are still there on social media. You are following all these guys. I, 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 I would say the people who really gave me that drive yeah. to establish your own platform, I followed... Alex Magaisa's Big Saturday Read, yeah. R.I.P. to the yeah. man. Yeah. Um, I followed Fadza Mahere, even though I no longer agree with their politics. Yeah. I followed Donald Doja, R.I.P. Yeah. I followed 
Ronald Maguita, Simtain Mint, and chiefly uh, Larry Quirirai with three men on a board. Yeah. And then a bunch of semi pop artists, Ten Diamonds, Junior Brown, and other artists from other genres. And um, uh, Terroni Guitar, yeah. Hope Masike, uh, Cindy, yeah. Cynthia Mare. Yeah, I was doing a lot of local content. <laughs> <laughs> and I felt I have to I have to speak local. I yeah. have to be Zimbabwe. Yeah. So 2017 around March uh didn't have much money. So I called on my other five friends, said, guys, here's an idea that I have. Could you please assist me with money? Yeah. And they assisted. And then the website came to life. Oh, so this was like domain registration, yeah. all of that. Yeah, like, yeah. I, I, I don't know, but don't you think it's, it's, it's very unusual, you see, for a person who is just coming out of A level <laughs> to say, I don't want a free website, is in sphere.blogspot.com yeah. or is in yeah. yeah. Was yeah. I, in 2016, <laughs> I, actually, I actually created a zinsphere.wordpress.com. But then I was like, nah. Yeah, I, this is not it, bro. I, I want so the proper this thing. Is not the one. So the website came to life, uh, courtesy of Spectrum, who is still the guy behind the site. Yeah. Yeah. So we started writing. One of one of the first reviews I wrote was Arapu's Naibi, produced by Zand. Yeah. yeah. I love that. <laughs> I love that. And so the truth that I have come to realize yeah. through writing, because I do not only write music, I write all sorts of stuff. Mm. You see? Poetry, um, prose. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so what you're trying to do is I can be I can be this, but I can be so many versions of myself. Mm. But I'm still sharing one fundamental truth that I'm an artist, I'm a creative, I'm a thinker, you yeah. know, and I'm a doer at the same time. So that's what we try to do when we are establishing these platforms yeah. and even contributing for other platforms too. Yeah. Yeah. Because you get to a point where you realize that art is, is sacred. Art is, art, is, art, is more than, art is more than the individual. It is the individual first looking for, for, for recovery and then, try, and then sharing uh, that journey of, of recovery. And to be met with negative comments is really disturbing, yeah. it's really demotivating. But also at the same time, in the making of art, there are those who are making art that is not speaking truth to power, or art that is not speaking the yeah, reality truth. of the people. Yeah. It's, it, is, it is art, it is, it is popular culture. Yeah. And for me, popular culture is, is destructive, and I dislike it. Yeah. I dislike it very much. <laughs> I think regular readers of, of Zimsphere or those who even read my political articles as exponent or some other platforms can attest to that. Because the yeah. thing with, 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 with uh, popular culture or mainstream uh, urban culture yeah. is that it, it is a sort of art that has been captured by elite interests in order not to make the people develop critical mm. consciousness. Mm. So you see. A distraction? Exactly. So you'd realize that there are people who say, I won't listen to Soldier Love, I won't listen to Windy President, I won't listen to Doba Don, because that's ghetto music. Why are they saying that? Mm. Because they realize that Zim Dance or, or even Zim Hip Hop, because Zim Hip Hop originates, this music originates either from the south or the north. Yeah. Uh, when you're talking about that imaginary line code so <laughs> yeah. the controversial yeah. line <laughs> so you see people are making their art and then there are these elite interests you know they are so determined because they know that Zim Danso, Zim Ebob, or whatever the youth are saying are speaking they know that this is the voice of the youth yeah. this is the voice of the people it's their lived reality exactly. and they are speaking their struggles they are speaking their truth and 
at the same time, they're trying to make a change, trying to call each other to resist domination. Yeah. So they would rather you sing about less important stuff or, yeah. or insane stuff <laughs> as, as, as we saw Passion Java doing, you see. Yeah. Basically sponsoring vapid art so that people don't realize that <laughs> art has the potential to change people's mindsets. Art has the potential to change people's thinking, to make people stand together in solidarity. Yeah. You see? Because if we live in a country where Bob Marley came to celebrate with us our independence yeah. and paint a song <laughs> specifically for, for us, us, then what makes you think that we are not going to emulate uh, a sort of art created by black people in the Caribbean or uh, to emulate black art created by people in the United States? Yeah. I'm talking about hip hop, r yeah. yeah. Because if you actually look at the origins of, of, of hip hop, that was, that was a mad revolution, mad revolution. But yeah, a lot of fighting. Through, through, through that commercialization, and now ETC, we a, ETC. A place. It's not just, uh, okay, I would say bubblegum music. <laughs> so Zinsei is not for bubblegum music. It's not for bubblegum culture. <laughs> it's not for bubblegum culture. <laughs> I hear you, man. Um, and so, uh, what are some of the challenges that you've incurred in running a website like Zimsphere within the context of Zimbabwe and trying to deliver information to Zimbabweans? I think uh, the biggest challenge is trying to create content uh, with the hope that it reaches people, a significant amount of people, yeah. but where there are all these other profit-driven factors fighting yeah. against you. <laughs> so you are in an industry where there are veterans, sort of. Yeah. Yeah. But I, 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 I got into that space not with the intention of being competitive because as I said, yeah. I was drawing inspiration from platforms like 3 Mob, Zimbo Jam, yeah. uh, Zimtainment. Zimtainment, even Texan. Like, Let's go. Yeah, like just like just the <laughs> I idea love that. <laughs> just the idea of just having this site creating content, delivering it to people in a Zimbabwean context, speaking yeah. Zimbabwean stuff. Yeah. So you realize that for the most part we, these social platforms, you know, work in a way that when you're still new, you have to fork out some sort of capital yeah. to make sure that your content engages with high, high, high number of users yeah. <laughs> and so that it ranks high up there, yeah. even on Google rankings. Discoverability. Exactly. <laughs> so I think for the first 2017, 18, 19, yeah. 20, we were battling with that. And then so say, essentially, mm -hmm. let, me, let me cut you off, I just want to understand. Yeah. Uh, you're pumping, the idea I get is you're pumping in money, but at this point, no money is coming back. Is, is that what you're saying? Uh, yeah, exactly. Okay. I think this, is, this, this can be explained by the point that I'm now making. Okay, fair enough. That you, you, you are having these internet challenges, and, it, and then there's the issue of having to pay your host and your designer yep. every year. <laughs> Domain name. Yeah. <laughs> so what happened is the first Zimsphere site, Zimsphere.com, yeah. was created on, on, on a WordPress platform. So I think we parted with we had to part with 40, 30, 40 dollars a year. Yeah. Sometimes it was not a it was not a astronomical figure yeah. to come by. Yeah. Because it's an annual fee of thirty, forty dollars, but because for the most part we were still university students and we didn't have that, ta -ta, like that. Yeah, I don't know. It sometimes, sometimes I would ask my sister to 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 give me money so that I could pay the host. Yeah. Sometimes I paid myself because July twenty seventeen till date, I have been writing for the African Exponent. 
in yeah. they pay. But sometimes that money wouldn't be there because at the University of Zimbabwe, there are serious accommodation problems. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, especially 2019, 2019, 2018, 1920, I, I, I wasn't living on campus. I was renting outside premises. Yeah. So, uh, for the most part, your parents would give you rent money and money for the initial groceries as the semester begins. Yeah. But as the months are progressing, mm, the money is, that money is, money is running out. <laughs> so you are now using, using your own money that you're being paid uh, by these exponent guys mm. to buy certain groceries. Mm. And, it's a drive, essentially. Yeah, and for, 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 and for, and for leisurely purposes. You know, you have students and yeah. you're living in a city. Yeah. Things come out. Yeah, you're Interesting chasing, things yeah, to you're do. chasing things. <laughs> so it so happened that 2020, we failed to pay on time. Mm. This was zimsphere.com. Zimsphere.com. And then the whole website whew, vanished. Yeah. Yeah. It vanished. And I think we were almost into 400, 500 articles. All of that was lost. Everything was lost. So he said we need to start afresh, but on a cheaper platform. Yeah. So that's what we have now, zimsphere.co.zw, which is run on Blogger. And the fees is quite, it's quite reasonable, around $10, $20 per year. Yeah. And now that we are now professionals in, in, in the formal sector of employment, and also, I think we're now grown up. Yeah, you know, fair, fair to say. Paying, paying, paying a hosting fee is no longer an issue. Yeah. It is no longer an issue. <laughs> Even the discoverability issue, Ever since we started zimsphere.co.zw in 2020, yeah. that was June 2020, it has been, the success has been remarkable. Um, there are some artists you search, there are some content you search, and then zimsphere is the first you page, yeah. second page, like that. So, and, so, zimsphere is now at a stage where we have passed the phase where we were struggling to be out there yeah. organically. Yeah, okay, fair enough. But with the success that we now have and the fact that it is still organic, we haven't been paying. Like we don't do those boosted posts, yeah. ETC. Yeah. We haven't been doing that. So it's all been organic. And I think it speaks uh, of incredible commitment, you know, and hard work, tenacity, to continuously pump content yeah. to the extent that you grow you know, day by day. <laughs> Google has to notice that there are some kids who are writing. Yeah. 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 So yeah. those have been some of the main challenges yeah. that we face, but we are now we are now getting past them. But the biggest, biggest, biggest challenges of all is trying to have a platform which you hope is bringing in revenue, yeah. but which you know is not bringing in revenue <laughs> because the internet is wild and competitive like that. Yeah. yeah, so for the first five years, we're not focusing really on, on creating revenue, but rather the works on the site, yeah. the content <clears throat> would give some of us opportunities. Like, yeah. I got the opportunity to write for the African Exponent because someone had been impressed by my articles on, on the same sphere. Yeah. And this was someone who was reading music reviews. <laughs> <laughs> but they saw that, no, this guy is good with, with, with you know, journalistic stuff yeah. at the core. And you have some of our other writers who are also getting other opportunities you know, to be paid. For that matter, yeah. because of their dope content on Zimsphere. Yeah. So I think for now, Zimsphere is acting as a ticket to our credibility as yeah. good content creators yeah. without necessarily pumping in the money. But we are working towards that, and it's still a challenge, but yeah. we believe that challenges come and go. Yeah, they can be solved, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I love that, man. And so you touched on like a, a very important thing there, right? Mm -hmm. uh, 
as a journalist, you actually also contribute to a, a number of different platforms. African Exponent is one. Uh, I've seen some of your work on Backlink Africa. I've seen some of your work on African Curators. Mm -hmm. uh, I've seen a lot of your work in different places, is yeah. the point I'm making. Yeah. Um, you've spoken about how one of those opportunities come, uh, have come up. Uh, are there other ways you find these opportunities? How, how does that work? Because uh, the reason I ask is uh, journalists are in a weird position, especially just globally, but more so in Zim. Uh, mm -hmm. If we're talking opportunities-wise, money-wise, so people would look at stuff like that and be like, okay, how do I actually get my foot in the door and get some of these opportunities? What's the best way to go about it? Or if not the best, how did you go about it? You know, uh, getting these opportunities. You spoke of one, writing on SimSphere. My first intrinsic desire yeah. was to create quality content first, not clickbait. Because yeah. many of these <laughs> young guys creating sites and stuff are doing clickbait stuff. Yeah. And clickbait is like... I'm allergic. To, I'm allergic <laughs> to clickbait. I get sick. Yeah. Yeah. So the drive has just to been focusing on quality content. So quality content speaks for itself, and it defends itself in various spaces. Yeah. And also telling the world that when it comes to nonfiction writing, I can handle different sides of it. Yeah. Yeah. So we can be writing an article on. Zimbabwe Electoral Commission, we can be writing an article on Holy Chain versus Winky D. Yeah. We can be writing an article on US troops in Africa. Yeah. We can be writing an article on Chinese investors stealing from Africa. We can be writing an article on Fabric Party yeah. in Zimbabwe. <laughs> we can be writing an article on South African artist comes to Zimbabwe, collaborates with Zimbabwe artists. So just handling those different aspects, I think, has a ripple effect in itself because you know, people are impressed. It's also the same with um, this South African station, Power FM 987. Yeah. One of the producers read my article on African Exponent, I think around 2019, yeah. 20. And they said, yo, I would like to have a phone call with you, speak on this. And we've been having that, that thing up to now. Yeah, we, where, yeah. where they even call me on opinions, on stuff that I didn't even write about. Yeah. So they know that if we want to hear something from Zimbabwe, these takus were to call. Yeah. Yeah. So I think quality content speaks for itself. Quality content will naturally bring the returns when you're consistent at it. Yeah. Also, consistency is one of the challenges at Zim Sphere because <laughs> there's also life happening. You yeah, know? like you said, you've got a job. Right? Yeah, exactly. The other guys are contributors. Even the other guys have their own lives too. Yeah. You see, they're also <laughs> having jobs, having school, they're having their own personal stuff going yeah. on. But yeah, well, is it fair to, to assume that uh, consistency becomes a better thing if the platform can then uh, defend itself as a business that actually does does it work like that like you therefore have more time to dedicate to it because it brings in X amount and you can dedicate that to writers fair assumption or not really I think consistency has to be a combination of two factors yeah you have to see yourself as an entity that has to be viable and that has to exist into the future yeah. and at the same yeah. time as I talked about calling you have to see yourselves as people who are committed to serving the public with information at no cost. Yeah. So this is the contradiction. You have to survive, but You're you, something. You, you, you love life. You love life too much. You love art. You love stuff to the extent that you're like, no, you, you guys, I will share with you this information yeah. for free. You see? Yeah. So I think in balancing that contradiction, that is where yeah. we have conversations around sustainability yeah. and consistency. Yeah. So if you continuously see yourself as a business, then you're motivated that you see, we are 
ultimately going to get to the point where we have money. And also if you see yourselves as organically driven to serve the public yeah. with content, then you uh, no, 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 no. It's, it's, it's been three weeks without writing. Our readers are starved, yeah. you see. So that's how... Yeah, this is, it's, it's a delicate like, uh, push and pull right there. Exactly. I, I, I really understand it as someone who's working in media, still is working in media, trying to yeah. you know, uh, make all of this sustainable. But I, I love that because it pushes us in a very cute way into the last thing I want to talk to you about, right? Which is the state of journalism. Um, <clears throat> and this is your state of topics are hard because they're so broad, right? It's, it's such a sweeping statement. Mm -hmm. uh, but what I, what I maybe want to explore, right, is, and maybe we actually have explored it, you, you tell me what you think. Mm -hmm. Is all of this, man? It's 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 deliver. There's a mandate to deliver information to people, uh, more so in a place like Zim, where uh, the internet is really in its infancy. Uh, yeah, like yeah, yeah. us being on a, uh, on the internet, us delivering stuff like this via the internet. Mm -hmm. It's one a, a a certain degree of privilege. It takes a certain degree of privilege to make. Yeah, and consume. Yeah, yeah, there are a lot of people yeah. who don't get to see the yeah. work that we're doing right now, at least, mm -hmm. uh, because of that lack of privilege. Uh, so, it's the, the question I then want to drive to, mm -hmm. um, you talked about clickbait before. Mm -hmm. uh, journalism is in a very weird place uh, because uh, there are people who are <laughs> playing the survival game. Uh, yeah playing the bubblegum culture game because, yeah. uh, and just to give context to anyone watching who might not be in the industry, the way it essentially, the way it normally works is if I put out an article and it gets uh, 10,000 hits, mm -hmm. that essentially makes more than I put out an article and it gets 500 hits. Mm -hmm. And so that is why sometimes you see driven, uh, journalists being driven to uh, sensationalize things. Maybe they're reporting on something that actually did happen, but they twist it, so they'll say Mugabe gets shot in the head, and then yeah. you open the article and it's like Farai Mugabe, and you're like, oh man, really? That's, that's not what I came here for. Yeah. <laughs> All of these weird things. Um, how do you see journalism right now? Do you think journalism is in a, in a healthy place? And maybe what do you think are some of the things that need to change or need to be done more? Just, I know it's a really vague question, but I'm trying. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's actually a question that could possibly demand another episode of this all. Exactly. I but think I think we'll just, <laughs> we'll just try to, to make it compact. Yeah. Uh, the truth is journalism is in a sort of state. Uh, it's, it's actually sad. Yeah. Because the main point of journalism, the main point of being a media practitioner, is serving the public interest. So public interest has to be your innate desire, motivating you to continuously write for that newspaper, to continuously go and speak for the radio station, to continuously go and write for that website, you see. But I think we have to make reference to the book by Noam Chomsky and Herman. Yeah. Manufacturing consent, the, e the economy of. What? You can send the title to me. I'll put like a huge graphic next to you. Uh, basically, it's manufacturing consent, <laughs> the political economy of mass media. Yeah. I think so. What they say, what their main arguments in that book is media has filters. Right. Yeah. So we are talking about, one, there is big players, there is the big fish, that is your yeah. big business, your big politicians, and then there is editors, and then there is that need for advertising, yeah. and then there is, I'm forgetting some of them, but what they essentially say is media is driven by commercial interests. Media is driven by profit. Yeah. 
media <laughs> is driven by the need to shape people's narrative and people's consciousness so that it fits within the hegemony of what the dominant players in that political economy, that is your big business and big politicians, want you to think. Yeah. So firstly, media has to survive. And the primary avenue for media survival is adverts. Yeah. So you have your corporations, your private capital, putting in adverts in newspapers, TV, radio, internet, that's your Google ads. Yeah. I mean everything, Insta yeah. ads, like it's, everywhere you go. They're not, they're not even, they're not even putting ads in Twitter replies, bro. Yeah. Oh, it's twisted, bro, bro. Don't it's even get me started on that. <laughs> it's twisted. <laughs> so because of that, media now has to provide content with a mass appeal. So they know that if they provide content like that, revolutionary, radical, genuine content, then you know that the radio station is less. Uh, yes, listeners, the newspaper has less readers, yeah. the website has less readers, <laughs> the YouTube channel has less viewers, <laughs> etc, etc. So you now have your editors bringing together their journalists and reporters and creating editorial policies that don't poke at the system. Creating editorial policies that aim towards content which does not provoke and enlighten the masses. Because if you do that, you lose you lose the money, you, you lose, lose the, the sustainability. Views, <laughs> you lose the views, you lose the advertisers. <laughs> and you, you lose have the bins. <laughs> and, and, and you have your, 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 your presidents and your business leaders and your religious leaders saying, you know, you have to put us in a positive light. Yeah. And yeah. I've, been, I've been doing a, 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 a comparative analysis of print media because this issue of sustainability is more conspicuous in the print media. You see, remember that Daily News was once bombed? Yeah. In the early 2000s. Ooh, ooh yeah. Yeah, Daily I News remember was that, once like, bombed. So vaguely, but yeah. But if you read the front page of Daily News right now, <laughs> the editorial policy is now wild. Yeah. They, they now have this pro-government stance. Yeah. Like, and you're like, how can, how can it be that? Is this the paper that was once bombed like, for? Jimmy, <laughs> Sure, sure. So you see, but they have to survive. You see, yeah. um, the digital revolution, the advent of the internet, drastically affected print media, you see. So you also have your traditional print media going to the digital for sustainability. And to maintain your sustainability, you don't have to put radical content. Yeah. No one likes radical content. Makes people uncomfortable, isn't it? Yeah. It sometimes even the readers, right? Like sometimes yeah. even the people you want to help. You see. <laughs> So, you even have radio stations in Zimbabwe on those Sundays, you see, they be hosting religious leaders, what, what, and they yeah. saying that. But they know that we are in a Christian, we are largely Christian environment. Yeah. And on Sundays, people are going to tune into that. <laughs> but is that Christian leader saying, distribute your wealth to the poor? He's not talking about that. Yeah. If he talks about that, it's too radical. The radio station loses. Listeners loses advertisers. Yeah, that's filtered too. And the editor has to take a hefty salary than the reporter. Yeah. You see, so those issues of sustainability are putting journalism in a precarious a, place, man. Precarious yeah. is the word. <laughs> is the word. <laughs> it's the word. It's We're on the edge. We really are on the edge. Right so, now. I think media in Zimbabwe is failing to really do is proper job yeah. because it has to placate these interests. Private capital, you see. You see, a, a full page in the Herald or in the Standard is an advert. Yeah, yeah, more often than not. And then the next page, they are talking about, they're talking about watered down stuff. You see. They're not really saying anything. Of which that's what <laughs> that's what seems to be, that's what small independent outlets like us are trying to do. Yeah. Like I remember, I remember the, uh, I've been trying to do editorials on Zimsphere because uh, I'm a wannabe 
and want to be editor. <laughs> yeah. You're an editor, man. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I love, there's a guy I, I, I talked to, um, uh, so his name is Marcus. You know Marcus, exactly, Marcus mm-hmm. Calligraph. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He, he hates the word try. Either you are doing or you are not doing. There's no, middle ground is tricky. <laughs> no, I'll, I'll, start, I'll start to consider myself <laughs> A, a, an editor, editor. When I get my master's degree, let's go. I love yeah, that. in whatever field, that. either law or arts or whatever. Yeah. But when the master's degree is there, then you're now, you're now a proper, you're certified. You're now a proper intellectual. No one, no one can challenge yeah. you. <laughs> but the point I was, I was making was, yeah, I made an editorial that city life in Zimbabwe needs to be more humane and democratic. Specifically, yeah. looking at city of Harare, and. All others, Mtari, Blawayo, Gwenu, Mashingo. And I'm realizing that that piece was quite radical. It was quite radical. I shared it on Reddit. Yeah. yeah some of the responses were like, hey, you have your government doing this and that, what, what. Yeah. Like, but. And then I gave the article to, uh, to a very senior, very experienced, successful editor. Yeah. And then he said, no, you just need to develop your arguments in a more coherent manner, but this stuff is, this stuff is too, this stuff is too much. This stuff is too much. Yeah. So that's what small outlets like us are trying to do. To, because we are not really pressed with those issues of sustainability, mm-hmm. because we are we still, we we are still, still giving voice, right? ourselves time, <laughs> we believe that we can actually make returns yeah. whilst at the same time delivering radical content. Yeah. 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 So if we can have more young people coming up and drawing even lessons from older guys in the industry, yeah. where they have failed, where they have succeeded, I think we can, especially for us people who are doing music, YouTube, websites, Twitter, yeah. TikTok, LinkedIn, <laughs> Yeah, all of that. Yeah, I think we really need to be to be more serious if we are to save the media industry because yeah. for now it's just uh, superficial content. For now, it's just um, content that is captured by elite interests. Yeah. As I said, yeah. it's not Watered down it's content. not organic yeah. content that is yeah. coming out of our radio stations, you know, newspapers, blog sites. Yeah. It is, but there have been people who have been doing a commendable job. Yeah. Commendable job. Yeah. yeah. So I think we just have to move into that spirit as a collective. It is hard because the youth have been corrupted by, by the United States. Yeah. Actually, actually, <laughs> I actually blame the United States for this. You think so? Yeah. It's the United States. It's the United, In what s- way? It's the United States that started with this issue because we are talking about elites politicians and business leaders and religious people pushing this agenda of capitalism. Yeah, get rich, get rich. Get capitalism rich, get is rich. the thing, individual success, yeah. material world, <laughs> consumerism. So the way that cable TV developed in America is specifically focusing on news. Uh, that's so why you have your CNNs, Fox, ETC, yeah. ETC. And you look at the ownership of those media outlets. Yeah. You realize it's a, few, it's a few families, rich, super, super, super rich families yeah. who own all of, it. all of the media <laughs> in the United <laughs> States. All of, the all of it until at least the end from from to, from yeah. film <laughs> from film to Twitter to Meta to Awards, even yeah, every media just just popular culture. Yeah, like popular culture. Everywhere you turn, it, it's everywhere. A few people. It's a few people. Few few super rich people. And do you think those people will will relent in pushing their agenda? Yeah. Will they push want. a narrative that challenges their establishment. They would. They would <laughs> rather sponsor a sixty billion Hollywood movie. I don't know if that is too uh, hyperbolic. Mm. But they'd rather sponsor a multi-billion Hollywood movie than a 50,000 movie by an independent creator 
yeah. in yeah. in yeah. Iowa or in New Jersey. <laughs> Who, who is trying to who is trying to say a radical message? Yeah. yeah. So what yeah. what eventually comes to us here in Arare, Nairobi, Lusaka, Johannesburg, is that senseless stuff that is sponsored Always. by billions of dollars. Always. Always. And because we have believed that everything from the west or everything from the global north is mm. right, <laughs> you see, we are now also putting conversations around colonialism, imperialism, in white supremacy even. Yeah. Right? So we, we, we have an inferiority complex that we cannot develop our own organic radical Platforms. content if it yes. is not in the mold the of the West <laughs> or if it is not approved by yeah. the West. Yeah. And, this, and this permeates all levels of society. So I think even for us, for the likes of Anazim, Sphere, Story Untold, ETC, yeah. Yeah. I think we can get to that point where we have to just establish... Uh, a sizable audience that truly believes in that us. That believes, exactly. And that will genuinely reward us for you, <laughs> from their hearts. You, rewarding us from the point of saying, you, we want you to keep doing what you're doing. Yeah. And we don't want you to sleep on an empty stomach. And we want you to pay the electricity bill. Yeah. You see. And we, we want, want you to pay as well. And we want you to send your kids to school. <laughs> exactly. You see. So I think we can get to this that level, to even without being um, appealing in the mainstream. In the mainstream. Yeah, because yeah. you won't you won't find JD in the mainstream. Yeah. But it's the best ever producer to have ever done it. Yeah. You see. Yeah. 